So let's load up our initial patch that we made in episode one. Templates my MPE two. If you didn't watch episode one and you don't have this patch, I do recommend doing that because we'll craft one, craft an initial patch for you that is very suited to your hands and your playing style. If you don't want to bother with that right now, I do have a zip file linked in the description where you can go and get the same initial patch that I'm starting from, which will not be matched to your hands, but you can go back and do that later. And it'll have the curve set up and everything that you need to, to get through this video. So first thing, I have a couple important corrections to episode one, um, dealing with the uh, timbre curve down here. When we set these curves up, we took several seconds to delete some of these control points and just get the two. Thank you to Forrest in the comments who pointed out that you can just right click in this window and go to create minimal MSEG. And that will set you up a curve with just two points. Okay, and the second thing regarding the timbre curve, I had told you that there was a weird thing that happened to me when I was setting it up and it would play weirdly like this. Those strange poppings as it jumps back and forth to the wrong values. Thank you to Kite for pointing out that in that video, I forgot to disable this rate. And because I didn't disable it, it kind of obscured the problem. So that sounds better, but it's actually taking away my control because what's happening is it's following this curve in time and not really paying much attention to what I'm doing with my fingers. So the right way to set up this timbre curve is to disable the rate, set the phase to 50%, and the modulation from MPE timbre somewhere around 45. And now we should have a properly playing sound. So let's get into turning this into a cello. So the first thing we want to do is look at our oscillator and get a good basic wave shape for our cello. Our sound right now is very brassy. If you recall our rule of thumb, a sawtooth wave for brassy sounds, triangle for fluty sounds, and pulse for stringy sounds. And we want a stringy sound here. So I'm gonna to switch to the classic square oscillator. But really the square is just an instance of pulse. So when your positive and your negative durations in this waveform here are equal, then you have a square wave. And when they're unequal, then you get different forms of the pulse. The unequal pulse width is very good for string sounds, but the square wave itself I think is actually much more suited to a woodwind or a flute of some kind. It's a good substitute for the uh, triangle if you want a flute that has a bit more edge. It's got this hollowness to it, which is very cool, but it's not what we want in a string sound. So let's play with this width. That would be a good trumpet over there. Where the pulse wave really shines is when you modulate this width and you can get a variety of timbres in your playing. And we'll look at this cool thing Surge gives us, which is the width two parameter. And what this one does, as you'll see, is it modulates the wave shape asymmetrically, 
which makes it a little more interesting. And I found for this sound, what I want to do is have with one somewhere around 35%. with two somewhere around 18%, and modulate that with a timbre curve up to around 50%, a little less. And it's already sounding a lot more cello-ish. Now at this point, I'm gonna state the obvious and say that if we're trying to make a cello sound, it helps if we know what a cello sounds like. It also helps if we know something about the mechanics, if not the physics, of how the cello works. I picked the cello because it's a pretty familiar sound. I think most of us have probably heard quite a bit of it. So we don't really need to go super deeply into research on this. But if you want to get a nice recording of a cello, a solo cello, to use as reference and study it and compare your compare your sound against it, uh, that may be helpful. But I also want to take this moment to say a thing or two about my philosophy of sound design, which you do not need to follow, but it's informing my decisions here, and it may be helpful to know how it's doing that. So briefly, my number one rule of sound design is that I'm not trying to trick anybody. I don't really want anyone to believe this is a real cello. That's not my goal. What my goal is, is to get something that can perform the function of a cello and evoke the same kinds of emotions. And I like to think of it as I'm not aiming for a perfect physical reproduction of the cello sound because that's impossible. What I'm doing is I'm aiming at the platonic ideal of a sound of which the cello is only an approximation. And that way, theoretically at least, I could actually get a sound that is better than the cello because I don't have the physical limitations that the cello has. That's kind of a blasphemous thing to say because the cello is so awesome, but it's theoretical. And the way I'm going to approach that is by feel. I'm looking for emotional resonances. So when I'm playing my sound, I want to, I want to feel the way that I feel when I'm listening to someone play the cello. So I'm not going to get super analytical in, in studying an oscilloscope or a spectral analyzer or anything like that. I'm just going to go by how it sounds and how it feels as I'm playing it. On that said, I do take a lot of inspiration from the physics and the mechanics of how the cello works, and I think the results are going to turn out quite good. All right, with that out of the way, let's go take a look at our filter. Um, we have this filter modulated in our initial patch by the timbre curve. Well, we're not going to do that this time. So let's click that X and get rid of the timbre curve there. Let's turn that up a bit. Now let's modulate that instead with our pressure curve. Yeah, pretty high. Now, as I play with a lot of y-axis, you'll note the um, kind of harmonic that comes through. That's the shape that our width 2 is giving us when we modulate to around 50%. And I'm not sure exactly how realistic that is for a cello, but it is something I hear in a lot of string playing, and I'm happy to have it in our sound. It gets very vocal, like a human voice sometimes.
And I like that. That would be one of those things that is approaching that platonic ideal I talked about, perhaps more so than the cello does. So I was talking to Roger Lynn about an earlier version of this sound, and he mentioned that he prefers to use pressure rather than timbre to modulate the filter cutoff. And I will often do it the other way um, for reasons having to do with articulation, which I'll come to at the end. Uh, I think I found a better way to do that now. And so we'll go over that. But I think he's right about this because our general rule is to use pressure to control volume. And if you think about natural sounds, like if you pluck a guitar, it's going to be all bright and buzzy as you pluck it. But as the sound decays, the brightness will decay as well, and it'll get more dull towards the end. So I think he's right about that in general, but in particular, I think he's particularly right about that for this sound because I have this harmonic here. And I want to be able to play that delicately and not be screaming and buzzy every time I get there. But at the same time, I'm not entirely happy with how this pressure is controlling the cutoff. Because this pressure curve is calibrated to handle volume exactly as I want it to. And this is not exactly the same way that I want the brightness to go. So what I'm going to do about that is create a second pressure curve. Now let's go over to pressure curve. And if we right click on this, we can copy modulator. And if I come over to LFO3, right click can paste. And now I have a duplicate of my pressure curve. And rename it Pressure Curve 2. And now I'm going to use this one to modulate the cutoff. So get rid of the pressure curve there. Double click on Pressure Curve 2. Drag that up a good way. And I think I want curve two to be shallower. This is one of those things that you're going to want to experiment with again and play with it a lot and adjust it until you find it. You have it right where you want it. I actually want it pretty shallow. So on pressure curve two, it is forgotten that it's being modulated by MPE pressure. So just set that to 95%. And let's see how that goes. And I want it a little brighter than this in general. And as you're, as you're playing around, you'll want to remember to play chords, which I often forget because I'm a very lead player kind of guy. Although if you want to be realistic, you will only play two note chords because that's what a cello is capable of. Unless there's some strange and crazy cello technique that I'm not aware of that lets you defy physics and play three strings that are in an arc with a bow that is straight. One more thing on the filter. So we have two filters here. And when I was experimenting with this sound, I was playing with the all pass filter. And I'll explain that sometime when I better understand it. But what turned out to work better was just to leave this filter off. But then you can adjust the filter balance. So all the way to the right here, this is an entirely unfiltered sound. Which is going to be the same at the end point as if I turned this cutoff here all the way up. 
but it's going to get there in a different way. So what we're going to hear is not one filter with the cutoff moving up, but a change in the mix of two filters. And it's going to sound a little different that way. So I'm going to add pressure curve two, and I'm just going to turn this a little over here so we can get an extra bit of brightness. Now, because I have my curve shaped like this, I have to really dig into the uh, to the pads to get that screamy sound. And that's the way I want it, because I don't want that screamy sound most of the time. Now, if we think about the instrument we're trying to emulate here, there are kind of three components to the sound. There are the strings, which we can think of our oscillator as the strings. Then there's the bow. We can think of the pressure as representing the bow pressure. And then the third element of the instrument is the body. And the body is not going to be modulated. It's not going to change. The cello doesn't grow arms and walk around when you're playing it. But it does have certain resonances and certain characteristics that we can get closer to. And there are a couple ways to do that. First, I'm going to go over to these effects, and I'm going to add an equalizer. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to give us an EQ boost at the resonant frequency of the cello body, which I looked up on the interwebs, and that frequency is between 147 and 196 hertz. So let's put that at 172. And then I'm going to turn the gain up 5 decibels. Now I'm listening on headphones because I'm recording my voice here. And the effect of this is very subtle on headphones. Um, this is probably the kind of thing you want to adjust when you're working with speakers. But once you've added the CQ, you should feel the lower notes a lot more when you're playing with speakers. And it will, it's actually a pretty nice feeling to it, in my opinion. And the handy thing about the instrument that I'm playing is I have twice as many notes in my range, thereabouts, than the real cello does. And of course, because we're using a computer, we can just transpose anything. So what that means is when we're finished with making this sound, we will not just have a cello, but we'll have a pretty good start for a viola and a violin and a double bass as well. So if you wanted to, we could change the body of this instrument to be a double bass, whose resonant frequency is between 82 and 117 hertz. Try that at 90. would probably want to adjust the filter there too. And we could be a viola with a range of 350 to 440. Let's set that at 400. And then the violin has a range between 440 and 550. And we can get creative with it too, like if we wanted to make the world's smallest violin, we drag this up to 10 kilohertz, transpose up good ways. A 
lot of times only dogs can hear the world's smallest violin. Okay, so let's bring this back down to 170 because we're making a cello today. And set the oscillator back to no transposition. So I think that adds a lot of warmth to the sound, but EQ is a really blunt instrument when it comes to modeling an instrument body. I'm going to turn down the mix on this EQ so we won't hear it for a little while. Turn it down to zero. And now I'm going to step outside of Surge for a moment. And you'll see down here on my Surge track, I have this Convolution Reverb Pro. Now I didn't want to talk about this because it's not part of Surge, but I think it really adds something to the sound and it will introduce concepts that we're going to need later in future episodes. So if you're using Ableton, this convolution reverb comes kind of built in. But if you don't have a convolution reverb, I will put a link in the description to a free plugin that you can use. Now I've been using convolution for 15 years or so, and I'm still amazed by it. This is total black magic, dark mathematics stuff. And the way it works is, if you were to go into a cathedral and record the sound of a gunshot, the resulting audio would contain a complete acoustic map of the cathedral. So then you can use that sound in a convolution reverb to make it sound as if you were playing in that cathedral. And that's what most people will use it for, I think. But it also works as a simulation of an instrument body. And that recording of the gunshot would be called an impulse response. And I recorded a few impulse responses before I started this tutorial. So these will also be included in the zip file linked in the description. So this is just me tapping the body of the cello with the bow near the bridge. And these are me tapping my homemade fiddle thing with sympathetic strings. So let's bring in cello one and see what it does to our sound. And now let's try one of the fiddles. So I use that idea a lot, and you can get very creative with it too, because you don't need a real-world instrument to build one of these impulse responses. You can basically use any quick little sound that you want. And I wanted to introduce this concept here because in future videos, we're going to be using impulse responses as an exciter for physical modeling synthesis. So these sounds are going to become our plucks. And you can get very creative with that and make some pretty awesome sounds. And I like using these for instrument bodies because the actual body of a cello has all kinds of curves and angles and different resonances and reflections in it. And those just aren't going to be fully represented by something as blunt as the EQ. But they're all there in the impulse response. All thanks to the dark magic of convolution with its roots in ancient Pythagorean mystery cults. But I don't want to rely on that in this tutorial, so I'm going to turn this back off. And we'll go back to Surge. And go back to our EQ. Okay, now I want to take a quick stab at adding some realism to our imaginary cello bow. I'm going to go over to Oscillator 2. And I'm going to choose Twist, and the engine will be Filtered Noise. And we're going to use this as frequency modulation. So up here to the oscillator FM routing, oscillator 2 will modulate oscillator 1. Turn that up to start at minus 15. It's going to sound kind of nasty. <laughs> Thank you.
And the point here is to kind of simulate the bow noise as isolated from the string sound. So the way the bow works to vibrate the string is, I think they call it stick and slide, as the rosin catches on the string and then lets go and then catches on the string and then lets go in very complex and noisy patterns. So it's going to be minus 15, and I'm going to modulate it with the pressure curve. And as I play with more pressure, I'm going to bring that down, say, minus 35. Because that, that bow noise is mostly noticeable on recordings, at least, when the strings are playing very quietly. And as it digs into the string more, the string sound will overwhelm it. So when we play loud, I don't want to hear that very much at all. And when we play softly, I do want to hear it. So let's see how it sounds now. And this would be a good time to step away and just tweak all the parameters until it gets to the point where it sounds and feels very good to you. And as you're testing it out, remember to play soft and loud, play chords, play high, play low. Okay, so that's it for the basic sound. Everything is set up and we can now play with the parameters until it's perfect for us. So I'm going to save this. I will save it in strings. And I'm going to call this Thought Form Basic Cello. And that will be in your zip file. And now I want to talk about articulation and the fact that we just made a solo stringed instrument and we have a problem with it. And the problem is that it's not exactly playing like a cello. So a cello doesn't really play polyphonically like this. And my synthesizer is starting a new voice for every note. Whereas a real cello only has four strings. And if you play multiple notes on one string, those notes aren't going to overlap. Now it's probably fine if the cello is not the focal point of the piece, but I am actually working on a piece in which I want this cello to be the focal point. And I did say that we're not trying to make an exact duplicate of a cello. So I would just let this go, except it is really cool the way that strings work, as far as the articulations of playing the sequence of notes on a single string. How I would set this up in general for my own use is I would use channel per row mode on the instrument, and I would have eight instances of surge, and they would all be mono and not poly. So it would be as though I had a cello with eight strings. But for now, we're just going to focus on the mono mode. So we'll just use one string. Now you can hear the problem. Which is that it takes a certain amount of time for my finger to reach a certain level of pressure as it touches each new note. And because we only have one note, we're not slurring the previous note over it to mask that drop in pressure as my finger comes down in the new place. So there's this dead spot that I think of as the sucking sound which is kind of a lack of a sound between the notes. And sometimes this can even sound like an accordion, which is not exactly what you want when you're making a cello. 
So first I want to think about the mechanics. On the real cello, there's no decrease in pressure when I change notes. Because the pressure is not coming from my finger, it's coming from the bow. And the bow is just keeping a constant stream of energy going into the string. Now people have come up with all kinds of clever ways around this. Um, often using an expression pedal or an extra controller of some sort to provide that constant pressure. But I want to see if we can do it just with our instrument and just with Surge. So for the first time in this series about synthesizers, I think, uh, we're going to use an envelope. And the envelope will provide that constant stream of energy. Now, in a typical envelope, we have four stages. We have attack, decay, sustain, and release. So the attack is how long it takes your energy to reach its maximum volume when the note is pressed. Decay is how long it takes to come down from that maximum volume to the level of sustain, which is an amplitude and not a duration. The sound will sit at the sustain level until you let go of the note, at which point the release is how long it takes your sound to fade to silence once you've released the note. So we're not going to use this envelope right here. We're going to make one with another LFO. So I haven't used LFO4 yet. Let's take this one and let's rename it Bow. And for the mode, we're going to come down here to this envelope generator. And now that we've selected the envelope generator, it's going to ignore all the stuff that we usually work with. And it's going to use this LFO EG set of sliders over here on the right. And this is pretty much already set up for us. We have the sustain all the way up, and that's where we want it. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to modulate our pressure curve. We're going to modulate both pressure curves. So I come back over to the pressure curve and go to the phase and look at its modulations. And we have MPE pressure at 95%. I'm going to change that to 50%. And then I'm going to add another modulation from the bow. And that'll be 45%. And we'll do the same to the pressure curve too. Except for this one, I'm going to add less of the bow effect because this is where we were getting really extreme and we want to stay from those extreme ends. On this one, I'm going to use 60% from, from the MPE pressure. And from the bow, I'm going to add 30%. And so now if I try to play something fast. But what I've sacrificed is now I can't play these really slow fade-ins and things. See, the sound just starts really suddenly. So what I want to do about that is use yet another curve. So I'll go over to LFO5. I'm going to rename this one velocity curve. And we want to set it up the way we have our other curves. So go down here and pick the MSEG. Open it up. Right click. Create minimal at MSEG. I'm going to drag this all the way down. Drag this all the way up. Now this is going to be taking the signal from our velocity, which is how hard we initially strike each note as a separate thing from how hard we're pushing at any time. So this is not pressure, this is velocity. Now what I want to do is have, I want this to have no effect at a certain level of velocity. 
So I want to have a dead spot in my curve at the beginning here as I play softly. And then I want to bring it up as I play harder. So this way, if I start my note really softly, then the bow envelope will have no effect. But if I strike it a little bit harder, then I'll get this fast play that I just demonstrated. Um, so for this, we need to control this with our velocity, turn the loop mode off, and disable the rate. Remember to do it this time. Okay, and we're not modulating. Oh, we are modulating phase. Sorry. Phase will be modulated with MIDI velocity, 95%. Now if we go back to the bow, we can set its amplitude to zero, and then modulate that with the velocity curve, 95%. Okay, back over in the velocity curve, make sure this is set to unipolar. That will matter. So now when I play very softly, now we're going to do one last thing to this, uh, to this bow. Back over here to the envelope generator. We want to turn this attack up just the tiniest bit. Um, that's going to make it slower, but just enough to get rid of that little... There's like a sharp edge to the beginning of the note. And we just want to soften that just a little bit. Since we had reduced the amount that our MPE pressure is modulating our pressure curve, I can no longer get to the maximum point on this curve because the uh, pressure is only taking us halfway and the bow is taking us the rest of the way. And we want to be able to reach that top volume even if we start with a quiet note. So what we're going to do is just add a point and put it over here. And we need to do the same for pressure curve two. Now this one we set the, uh, this one's getting 60% from the pressure and 30% from the bow. So we want it to meet, reach the top at about the 60% mark around there. And depending on the context in which you're using this sound, if it's in a mix, you might want to just turn up the overall volume a bunch. Maybe not that much. Turn the gain down. And always with the curves, you want to work with them until you've got them in just the right places. And always we want to feel comfortable playing, and we don't want to be pressing too hard. Okay, I want to make sure that I can reach that top, that top part with just position, or with just pressure alone. And I might actually want to add an extra point in here. Let's try that. Yeah, something like that should work. 
Okay, so play around with the velocity curve until it works with your others. That all feels very good to play. Everything sounds the way you want it. Then I'm going to save this. This thought form fast cello. And then through the magic of editing, it will become the one that I'm going to give you in the uh, in the zip file. And OK. I think that's it for our cello. Now you should be able to take this and build some other string instruments with it. One thing you might play with is the oscillator. Instead of this classic pulse wave that they call a square, you could load a wavetable. Surge comes with a built-in cello. If we modulate the morph with our timbre curve, play with that. Now I don't really love their built-in cello, so I made my own. And this will be included in Zip. A uh, funny thing about the wavetables, it seems like they're coming in an octave higher than the classic set, than the classic oscillator was. That's strange. And also, oftentimes the wavetable is not going to have as many harmonics as the raw as the raw pulse oscillator. So you want to turn up the filter. And one more fun thing to play with, I included my homemade fiddle thing. That's a very throaty sounding one. Okay, that concludes this episode. I will be back in a couple weeks, probably. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do for the next episode, but it's probably going to be plucked sounds. Because those are important and we haven't done a single thing with the pluck yet, I don't think. And if there's anything you're particularly interested in seeing, um, let me know in the comments and I will try to get to those things sooner rather than later. Thank you for watching.